great to be with you this morning. And what I thought I would do is just tell you a little bit about me and, and how I got to where I am and what I do to try to um, provide representation for the district that I represent and how leadership plays, I guess, into that. I never sought out to be a leader. As Kathy said, I, I grew up in what you would call a, a traditional ethnic Democrat uh, household in, in Columbus. My dad was a steel worker, uh, was a member of the United Steelworkers Union. And, and so that's how I grew up. Uh, my parents, uh, however, were personally conservative. My dad uh, was fiscally very conservative. He um, always used to complain when we were growing up about how much taxes he paid, and it was too much. Still does today as a retiree. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, an ethnic working class Democrat household. So that's how I grew up. I had a teacher in, in high school, a government teacher, who said to me and my, my classmates uh, in answering a question, you know, how do you know if you're a Democrat or Republican? I don't know if you've heard this story before, Bill. How do you know if you're a Democrat or Republican? Now, this teacher, um, I didn't know at the time, who was a really good friend of mine, is a very liberal Democrat. I didn't know that at the time. Uh, he and I joke about that today. And he answered the question, well, if you're white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, and your parents belong to a country club, you're a Republican. If you're anything else, you're a Democrat. So my class uh, was about 60% white, 40% African American, a lot of Catholics, few Jews. We all looked around and thought, well, we're all a bunch of Democrats, right? Um, so that was my introduction into government and politics in, in high school. And by the way, I had absolutely zero interest in government and politics in high school, and quite frankly, in, into college. I loved sports, I loved music, and I wanted to be, like many other kids um, growing up, boys, a professional athlete. Baseball, Cincinnati Reds. Didn't work out so well. So, um, loved music as well and played music in, in high school. And if you read my bio, some people kind of get confused because I, I was the senior class president at Northland High School, but I had, again, no interest in, in government or politics. It was kind of a lark, and I actually won. Uh, didn't set out that way, but it, it happened. Despite that, um, I knew at, at that point in time that I wasn't going to be making any money in uh, athletics or music. But I thought, you know what, next best thing would be to cover athletes, cover athletics. And so I decided to go to Ohio State to get a journalism degree and try out for the marching band. And I got lucky and I, I got uh, um, accepted in the tryout. I won a spot in the marching band. I was in the marching band at Ohio State for four years. I was a journalism major. Everything was great. Uh, one of my buddies in the marching band said, at the time we had basic education requirements, BERs, I don't know what they're called today, and we had, as an arts and science major, a number of requirements in the, uh, in the sciences that we had to, to um, to fulfill, and so one of my buddies in the marching band said, hey, you know, unless you really like chemistry and physics, uh, there's these political science classes that are a lot more fun, and you should, uh, you, should take, you should take this class. And so three of us took a political science class, and it was fabulous. It was, it was very interesting. We had a great professor, which led to another class, which led to a class by a guy in the name of Herb Asher. Uh, who is a uh, professor emeritus at Ohio State, great professor, really enjoyed his class, which led to an internship at the State House that I got closed out of. I was supposed to have the internship with either Rick Pfeiffer, who later became, who was a state senator, later became the city attorney in Columbus, or Joanne Davidson, who later became the Speaker of the House, and neither one accepted me, got closed out. So a TA called me and said, it's amazing how life works, Kathy, called me and said, I got bad news. We don't have space for you in this internship. You can still take the class. You can still get credit. We have a former student who is an aide to your congressman. His name's John Kasich. Uh, they have a spot for you in their office in the federal building 
downtown. It won't be that good of an experience. It'll be really boring, quite frankly, in a congressional district office, but you'll get the credit. And so I said, sure, why not? Uh, so I uh, did the internship. It was a fascinating experience working in, a, in an, a congressional office as an intern, and that's why I promote internships both in my DC office and my district office because it was a fabulous experience for me. We had a, a record number of interns actually this year. So uh, I take the internship, it's fall quarter, I'm in the marching band, working at TJ Maxx, paying my way through, through school. When at the end of the internship, at the end of the quarter, after the quarter was already done, we had a bowl game, went to the bowl game, came back, cleaning out my desk when the congressman says to me, hey, no, you're working at TJ Maxx, paying your way through school. Uh, we really appreciated your work ethic and you were really good on the phone, really good with constituents. We'd like to hire you part time. Think about it over the weekend if you'd rather work here than TJ Maxx. <laughs> Didn't need the weekend to think about it. Uh, though I enjoyed working at TJ Maxx, uh, retail wasn't my world or cup of tea. So that kind of started me in, in, uh, in the world of government and politics. And the, the fascinating thing about working in a congressional office that a lot of folks don't realize is that you have, and we have the mayor of up Arlington here, is that you get all sorts of calls in a congressional office, whether it's picking up trash, potholes, whatever. Uh, people are usually calling a congressional office for help when they've exhausted all other means. And, and so, as, uh, as Dave knows, we get some, sometimes we get calls about the city of Westerville saying, hey, can you help us? And, and no, I really can't, but I know somebody who can, and he's the city manager of Westerville. But the great thing about that experience was you, you, know, you learn in a book certain things, but as in anything else, in real life, you learn a whole different experience. And so I, I really enjoyed helping people, and, and I was already kind of in the line of service, whether it was in high school, whether it was in college, uh, service, may, maybe not public service, but service was always something that was important to me. And, and so the job just kind of blossomed in the, uh, in the congressional office. I had an opportunity to go work in DC for the congressman, chose not to, because I love Central Ohio, grew up here, uh, lived here my whole life, and kind of wanted to stay here had no interest in running for office, when one day at a funeral home, literally, in Columbus, in 19, late 1991, a, a woman by the name of Joanne Davidson, who I, I said earlier, um, got closed out of her office, came up to me and said, there is new lines that are being drawn, and there is, a, so every 10 years through this uh, redistricting process, the 99 House districts in the state of Ohio and the 33 Ohio Senate districts are redrawn based upon population patterns. As some of you know, in the 1980s, we had tremendous growth in Franklin County and Columbus. Cleveland lost population, Youngstown lost population, so Northeast Ohio lost some seats. Columbus gained some seats, three seats, and one of those seats was in the northern part of the county between Westerville and Dublin, Northland, North Linden, far north Columbus, so the parts of Franklin County and North Columbus that were not only in the Columbus School District, but also in the win-win areas of Westerville and Worthington and Dublin. It was a brand new seat, no incumbent, and I decided to run. I uh, quit my job, knocked on doors for 98 straight days, and decided uh, to, to, to try this, and won. And so I get elected in 1992, Vern Reif, uh, who until recently held the, the, t the, uh, the distinction and record of being the longest serving speaker of a legislature in the country, uh, was the speaker, and he was an amazing guy. Uh, he um, served for over 20 years as speaker. That doesn't happen anymore in Ohio because of term limits. And he ruled with an iron thumb, fist. Uh, he was uh, very, very powerful. I didn't know better. So in February of my first year, I get a call from one of the county commissioners, her name was Dorothy Teeter, 
who said, there is a bill that's moving through the legislature. It's a terrible bill. It takes power, against ele takes power away from elected county commissioners and gives it to uh, non-elected board of elections members. You've got to stop this bill. I said, well, sure, yeah, I'll do that. So I told Joanne, who was our minority leader at the time, uh, about the call with Dorothy and Joanne. Joanne laughed and said, Pat, we're in the deep minority. We can't stop anything. But don't let that stop your enthusiasm. So we came up with a plan. There were a dozen former county commissioners among Democrat elected officials in the Ohio House. And so each one of them I set out to, to talk to about why this was not a, a good idea. It took a lot of time. Not all of them called me back. And not one of them, not one of them committed to supporting the bill on the floor, even though everyone that I talked to said it was the right thing to do. But Vern Reif was a pretty powerful guy. So I, um, I set out to talk to the, the sponsor of the bill. It was a Democrat from Cleveland. He would never call me back. He just totally ignored me. So the bill comes to the floor. Typically, when a Republican offers amendment during the Vern Reif era, um, the good old days, he would not allow a vote on the amendment. He would table the amendment, meaning there would be no vote on the amendment, just a vote on the procedural tabling. But because I was a freshman, I think he thought, no one's going to vote for this amendment on our side, because this Republican freshman's offering this amendment. He hasn't been here but a month. So we had a debate. The sponsor of the bill was not very prepared for, uh, for the debate, quite frankly. And I offered the amendment. And rather than table it, the speaker had a vote on the amendment. And eight of those 12 Democrats actually voted for my amendment. Again, we were in the minority. And right in front of me was a Democrat from Cleveland who's now a judge. His name is Ron Suster. And when my amendment passed, Ron Suster turned around and said to me, well, now, son, you've done it. You've lost your parking spot. You've lost your aid. Uh, life won't be the same. I'll get back to that in just a second. So the speaker uh, was visibly upset. The sponsor of the bill went up to the speaker's rostrum. And rather than have a vote on the final bill after my amendment passed, he immediately adjourned the session and called for a, Democrat, a Democratic um, caucus to talk about it. So Ron Suster, the guy that I just talked about, who's now a judge, said uh, that to me. And I found out. Uh, within the hour that Ron Suster was a chairman under Vern Reif and moved a piece of legislation that Vern Reif didn't want to be moved and voted with Republicans at the same time on a different bill and literally lost his chairmanship, lost his parking spot, and lost his aid for two years. Now, you guys think politics is tough today. Um, we just didn't have technology and cable news and 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 the way that communication is just so much more transparent today. Um, so Vern Reif was an old throwback. So the next morning, I walked into the office. It's like 8.15. And my aide, my state house aide says, uh, you know, this, is, this is the days before Blackberries and cell phones where you couldn't call anybody, right? So she says to me, Vern Reif wants to see you immediately. The speaker's office called. Now, I thought she was joking, right? And i like, oh, very funny, Aaron. That's really, really funny. She said, no, I'm not laughing. This is not funny. This is not a joke. You're supposed to go up there immediately upon coming in. Like, oh, crap. I'm going to lose my parking spot. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. And so very intimidating. And so I, I go up into the speaker's office. And again, he's a Democrat. I'm a Republican. Uh, he's from southern Ohio. I'm an urban kid from Columbus. Uh, very, very different experience for me. Uh, but this guy had been one of the most powerful people in state government for 20 years. And he got along with both Democrats and Republicans. He had a really good relationship with George Voinovich as, as governor. Uh, had a really good relationship with um, the minority leader for a long time, a guy named Corwin Nixon. Uh, Stan Aronoff was a Republican Senate president. Paul Gilmore before that. So he had relationships, but, but pretty, pretty powerful guy and pretty intimidating, and talked with the Southern Brawl. And for almost an hour, he told stories. 
he told stories that went back before I was born about relationships he had with presidents, uh, with vice presidents, uh, with leaders of our country and state. And I just listened in awe, waiting for the hammer to drop about my parking spot. So I'm just listening. And Abe comes in and says, Speaker, you have a, an appointment you have to go to. So he gets up. I get up. We start walking to the door. He puts his arm around me and says, I just have one message for you. And the message is, what you did yesterday, I won't use the word he used, was, was, was pretty, I'll just use amazing. Uh, and I'm not mad at you for that. Because you didn't know better. You were just trying to do something, and you didn't know better. But I'm in charge here. And in the future, if you want to get something done, you need to come talk to me first. Because I can guarantee you, my eye's on you now. And as long as I'm speaker and you're here, you will not get another thing done unless you talk to me first. Now, I'm mad at my guys. I'm not mad at you. But from now on, I'll be mad at you, too. Uh, wow. Uh, what an amazing experience that was. I never asked him for anything, by the way, in the future, uh, in the next two years, and got some things done behind the scenes. But I tell you the story for two reasons. Number one, the good old days weren't exactly the good old days. And sometimes we forget about that. Politics and governing is, is tough. It's hard. It's always been hard. It's just that there's so much more light on it today, which, by the way, is a good thing. Transparency is a good thing. And, and having light on it is a good thing. What's challenging for anybody in elected leadership today, whether it be at the school board level, whether it be at the, at the city, uh, whether it be at the county or the state or the federal government, is that we, we, because of that transparency as well as technology, in, in the world today, and technology can be really good and technology can be really bad. As, as a country, uh, Americans, and this is not just Americans, by the way, um, people tend to want to get information that corresponds to their belief. And we live in a divided country where people self-select where they want to live, and they also, which is fine, but they also self-select what they want to hear. And so when I was a kid growing up, and many of you experienced the same thing, the news was, was coming from fewer sources. And if you were a journalist studying journalism, you ultimately went and worked for a newspaper. And so if you live in Columbus, Ohio, you're getting your, you're getting your information from a newspaper with the Dispatch or the Columbus Citizen Journal. If, if, if you're not getting it from the, the, the dispatch, you're getting it from the radio, from a news guy or woman who also is a journalist. Or you're watching the news at night, and I'm going to really date myself, Chet Long, or Hugh DeMoss, or, or Walter Cronkite. Again, very fewer news sources and, and journalists. Today, I have constituents who watch the news and get the news from Sean Hannity, not a journalist. Rachel Maddow, not a journalist. Rush Limbaugh, not a journalist. But you can't convince people of that. And so if they don't get it from that, they go to a blog that's either a liberal blog or a conservative blog. And they get it from that. And so we have the country divided, and we have Congress a reflection of that division. So take the health care bill as an example. The, the health care bill is um, the health care process. Today, um, I was there when the Affordable Care Act passed, and the Affordable Care Act has done some good things, but it's done some perverse things as well. I'm going to give you one example. So I was sitting in a room at the White House with, with President Obama when he talked about how we were going to bend the cost curve. And, and by the way, on health care, um, President Obama, who was a senator before he was president, didn't have a lot of details about the health care bill. He had like a 50,000 foot level. 
And I tell you that because we had a discussion with him, those of us in, on the Republican side who had voted for the Children's Health Insurance Program, there were 34 of us um, that he called in to see if we'd vote for the, the health care bill. And at one point he said, I don't really want your ideas, I just want your votes. We have the votes to pass uh, the Affordable Care Act. We'd like Republicans to vote for it. He said, we want to bend the cost curve. I'll give you one example. And the way we're going to do that, we're going to give everybody insurance so they don't end up in the emergency room. Because the, the most expensive form of health care for the federal government, either through Medicaid or, Medi Medicaid or Medicare, is reimbursing emergency room care. So if we keep the uninsured out of the emergency room, we'll save money. Makes total sense. It was one of the things I agreed with. Fast forward, I become the health subcommittee chairman a year and a half ago, and a nonpartisan government arm called MedPAC comes to visit me to give me kind of a 50,000 foot level uh, review of the Affordable Care Act. And one of the first things they said was the cost curve didn't bend. In fact, emergency room visits didn't go down, they went up. Like, you're kidding me. What? That doesn't make any sense. Well, the folks that the thought process would be, if you didn't have insurance and now you did, you expand Medicaid, you have the exchanges, more people have insurance, not as many as we thought, not as many as CBO said, but more did. Why would, why would emergency room visits go up? Well, generally speaking, the people who went to the emergency room visit went to the emergency room before without insurance, now had insurance, either private or Medicaid, they still went to the emergency room. They didn't change their behavior. Didn't change their behavior at all. And unfortunately, what did hospitals do generally? Not all, but many. And you'll notice this now since I mentioned it here in Central Ohio. Hospitals, rather than and I don't blame them for this, rather than try to help educate generally that population that did this, they made it easier for them to, for, for people to go to the emergency room, you and I and, and them, by building more emergency rooms. The absolute wrong thing to do, make it more convenient to go to an emergency room. So now you have standalone emergency departments throughout the community, including in this community. And so, a few years ago, we have a neighborhood uh, gathering a few miles from here on 4th of July, and one of the young boys hurt his leg, and mom says to dad, take him to the emergency room, right up the street. And dad says, well, why don't we just take him to the urgent care? Well, why are you going to drive by the emergency room to take him to urgent care? Just take him to the emergency room. Well, I don't think he broke it. I think it's just a, you know, I think it's a sprain. Take him to the emergency room. Now, their copay may not be any different between the emergency room, or maybe it's 50 bucks more. But let me tell you, the cost of the emergency room visit for that young man versus the cost of the urgent care is significantly different. Somebody's paying for that. And, and that's part of the problem with, with healthcare today. So, I tell you that because as we try to fix the healthcare bill or replace it, whatever we end up doing, as opposed to what the governor talks about today, who's a good friend of mine, Republicans and Democrats should just work together. Here's the problem we have in America today, going back to Rachel Maddow and Sean Hannity. Democrats represent areas in urban parts of America. Republicans represent areas in rural and suburban areas are split. And so for a Democrat to actually repeal and replace Obamacare, pretty tough to talk about that back home. Because more than likely, the Democrats representing constituents who doesn't want to repeal and replace Obamacare. And their idea of actually fixing Obamacare, their constituents' ideas, is actually moving toward what Bernie Sanders wants to do, which is more government control of, Obama, of, of healthcare, right? So think about that. If you're a Democrat, more than likely, your constituents want you to fix Obamacare by making government in control more. 
Whereas if you're a Republican, your constituents actually want less control. So then you have this divide and you don't have presidential leadership on top of that. So you have the perfect storm on having what we have today and that's just health care. And that's what makes it difficult to lead. Now the irony is, and some of you will not care that I say this, but it is what it is. I have really good relationships with Republicans and I have really good relationships with Democrats. Some of my Democrat colleagues thinks, think Republicans have horns. Some of you in the room might think Republicans have horns. Some of my Republican colleagues think Democrats have horns. And some of you in the room might be Republican and think Democrats have horns. That's insane. Because our system of government was set up for, for compromise, quite frankly. And you know what? The Congress is filled with a lot of good people. I don't agree with all of them. I think some of them are, 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 are whack jobs, right? Um, on the left and the right, by the way. But here's the point. Most of them are really good people and are representing their, their constituents, a majority of their constituents. And outside the big issues, uh, no, I'm talking about the issues that if you turn on to CNN tonight and, and if you turn on Fox tonight, and if you turn on MSNBC tonight, you'll hear the big issues. Go below that and there's actually things getting done. I, I work with a very liberal Democrat who, who um, is a good friend of mine. I have dinner with him a lot. We passed a home infusion bill, bipartisan, for Medicare recipients. Now, if you get home infusion, it's a pretty big deal when we get this bill signed into law. And, and the more we can do that in Medicare and Medicaid, get you out of an institutional setting and in the home, that is not only better for you as, as the patient, but it's going to save the government and taxpayers a lot of money in the end. It's a big deal. Now, no one's going to talk about it on the news tonight. No one's going to talk about it on talk radio. So those things are getting done, but it's harder to get the big things done. I'll give you an example. I have another Democrat friend of mine. He's like a, a second father to me, He's a very liberal Democrat. Uh, he's come to my defense uh, during Ways and Means Committee meetings from other Democrats because he knows my heart, I know his heart. We've been trying to figure out a way to compromise on tax reform. And <laughs> there's just no compromising with him. We, we just can't. He doesn't believe the corporate rate should come down, but he's willing, he's willing to see the corporate rate come down to 25%, it's 35 today. We have the highest corporate tax co uh, rate in the world. Canada's down in the teens now, just to give you an example. And he says to me a few weeks ago, I'll vote reluctantly, and it'll be tough in my district to lower the corporate rate to 25, but we have, we have to raise the top two rates. I'm like, really? I said, Bill, think about it. Now, I was a realtor once, not, not nearly as successful as Jill, but I was a, a realtor once, and it was the first time in my life after working at McDonald's and after working at, at uh, a gas station pumping gas, which my, which my girls say, why would you pump gas? I mean, why would you do that? Well, yeah, back in the day, right? Uh, so landscaping, I always got a paycheck. So when I was a realtor, and this helped me a lot uh, in the committee that I'm on, for the very first time in my life, at the end of the quarter, the manager in my office said, don't forget to send a check to the IRS and the Ohio Department of Taxation. Like, what do you mean? Well, you have to pay taxes on those closings. I'll, yeah, I guess I do. How much different the debate on the tax code would be today if every American had to send a check to the IRS every quarter and every American had to send a check to the Ohio Department of Taxation every quarter. So I said to my friend, my Democrat colleague, I said, so today the top rate is 39.6 plus the Obamacare taxes. So it's really 44 on, on income taxes at the federal level. Plus, depending on what state you live in, it might be another 5%. 
And plus, depending on what locality you live in, it could be another 2 or 3%. So now it's over 50 for the most successful person. It's like, yeah, okay. I said, okay, so, so Bill, let's say I'm a self-employed person. I start my own business. No one's going to, as my dad always has said to me, no, no one guarantees success. In America, you have an opportunity. You should always guarantee somebody an opportunity, but no guarantee for success. And so let's say you are successful. And Bill, you make a million dollars. Incredible. You put it all on, you make a million dollars, you sell a lot of houses. And now the federal government's going to say, I'm going to take federal government and with state and, and local income taxes, over 50% of what you make. This is before insurance. This is before rent. This is before workers' comp. Over 50%. Is that enough? Over 50%? And he, I almost had it. He's like, well, that's crazy. But it is a million dollars. So, so we had this, oh, I can't do that. No, I can't. I can't. I, we, we can't reduce their taxes. We've got to increase their taxes. So the challenge in this environment is trying to, to compromise. And it's hard on those big issues, really hard on those big issues. And if you've never had, and most members of Congress haven't, had to write that check, it's a whole different experience. And so the challenge going forward and it's not just about me. Uh, you know, here in Central Ohio, we have three of us that get along pretty well. Steve Stivers uh, from Upper Arlington, uh, Joyce Beatty from Jefferson Township, and I. And part of that is we knew each other before we, any of us were in Congress. We, we worked together down at the State House. And so we knew each other pretty well. We trust each other. We understand where we come from. And we work together on things. And part of leadership is working together across, at least in the political sphere, party despite the consequences. I have colleagues, and, and I know Joyce has colleagues, they won't work with Republicans because they're afraid, and I have colleagues who are Republicans who won't work with Democrats because they're afraid they'll be criticized back home. Again, back to what our government was set up to do. It was set up to compromise. And, and, and the challenge uh, today in public office is because we're so divided, I put out a statement on an issue, any issue, you name the issue, and it gets criticized by the left and the right. And, and so we have colleagues who say, you know what, I'm just going to stick to my shirt or skins team rather than try to do the right thing. And what I was taught by uh, uh, my best teacher in high school was, and this applies not just to, to, um, to politics but leadership, is you know what, Pat, as a senior in high school, you got to look yourself in the mirror every day and be comfortable with the decisions you make. And if you're comfortable with the decisions you make, you can sleep at night. I didn't sleep too well last night because I had an eight-year-old wake us up in the middle of the night with a bad dream. But generally, I sleep pretty well at night because at the end of the day, for me, and this is, I think, the important part of leadership, whether you're the city manager of a, of a city or a college president, if you make decisions based upon all the facts in front of you and you can defend those decisions, now everyone is not going to agree with your decisions. I learned that a long time ago. You know, I could do really well in my job and I still could have 50 40% of the people not agree with me, but that's okay. That's all right. They're entitled to disagree with me. And if I get 51% to disagree with me, I'll lose my job, and that's okay too. Because if you feel comfortable in making that decision with all the information presented to you, that's what this is about. And, and so that's, for me, what leadership is about. You get as much information, you try your best to get people to buy into that decision, and you, you move forward. And you don't try to, um, I'll, give you, I'll give you one more example. 
George Bush, when he was president, passed um, a tax bill that he couldn't get made permanent because he couldn't get 60 votes in the Senate, which is a magic number in the Senate, if you haven't heard about that. So he went through a process, much like the health care bill, where he, where he was able to get over 50. Um, and he got Max Baucus, who was a Democrat from, from uh, Montana, to support this. But it had to be temporary. So it was a 10-year bill that, that, uh, that passed that reduced tax rates across the board. That was going to expire at the end of 2012. And so President Obama, Speaker Boehner couldn't come to an agreement, tried really hard. Uh, the left was opposed to an agreement. The right was opposed to an agreement. Joe Biden, the Vice President, Mitch McConnell, came together and came to an agreement, a bipartisan agreement, that stopped the tax hikes for about 90% of Americans. The left hated it because we were keeping the tax rates low for some Americans. And the right hated it because we weren't, we were allowing tax rates to go up on 10% of Americans. So Senate passes the bill, the agreement, on New Year's Eve. So New Year's morning, while you all are having a great time, I'm in the basement of the Capitol, eating still donuts and cold coffee, having this debate. The next day, tax rates go up for everybody. Rush Limbaugh is going crazy over this, right? So, and, and our phones are ringing on New Year's Day, which I just can't even believe people are paying attention on New Year's Day to what we're doing, but, but they did. And we have Republican member after Republican member reacting. I can't tell you what, what happened in the Democrat meeting, because I wasn't there. But we had Republican member after Republican member said, I'm going to vote no, because I can't explain the fact that rates are going up for about 10% of Americans. The chairman of the budget committee, Paul Ryan at the time, now he's the speaker, got up and said, if you can't vote yes because it's the right thing to do, you shouldn't be here. Again, that's what leadership's all about. You can't explain it, you're voting no? Really? Because of talk radio? I had some pretty angry calls. But you know what, it was the right thing to do because it was a compromise. It's not about what I want. It's about a compromise in divided government. So um, if you can deal with that in, in today's America, you're gonna succeed in the end. And right now it's a challenge. It is a very big challenge uh, because our sister system of government wasn't designed the way that many Americans think it was designed. Many Americans think that our, our government, which is pretty special in terms of the way it was designed and different, many Americans think it's a parliamentary system. Meaning you win an election and you vote the way that people want to because that election was won. Well, our Senate, is not part of a parliament. A third of the Senate's up every time. Two thirds is not. 60 votes is important to try to get compromise. That's the rules of the Senate. The House functions more as a parliamentary. Majority matters. But the rest of our system isn't like that. And unfortunately, most Americans think it is. So going back to school, going back to my high school, government, Class, really important for people to understand our system of government today. It's really been great to talk to you a little bit about my job. It's been an amazing honor and privilege to have this job. I never imagined uh, going to, to school at Northland or Ohio State that I would ever be in an opportunity to be dog catcher, let alone member of Congress or any elected official. And one of the great things about this job is you know, despite the vitriol in, in politics today, is you get to learn a lot about the community you grew up in. You, you, get, you get to learn a lot about places you'd never seen or, 
or uh, people you never would have met who do amazing things um, and you never hear about it in the news, making an enormous difference in our society, in our local communities. And it's, uh, it's a blessing. I had, a, I had an uncle say to me, and we forget this as Americans, I had an uncle uh, who's a lawyer in Italy after I was elected, um, said, you don't realize how big a deal this is that you got elected to Congress. And he said, it's not about you, it's about the country that you live in. Because if your mother and father never came to America, think about this, Italy, a Western democracy. If your mother and father never came to America and you were born in Italy and raised in Italy and you wanted to run for the parliament, it had been pretty hard for you to get elected because you don't come from the right family. Think about that. Still, in a Western democracy. And in America, and this was right off the heels of Bill Clinton um, being our president, in America, you could come from nowhere, raised by a single mom and be president, or come from our family, the Italian immigrants, and, and get elected to Congress. That's something special about your country that you Americans don't realize. And you know what we don't realize? We, we, uh, we often two times spend, oftentimes spend so much um, on the negative and don't focus on the amazing things that happen here that don't happen anywhere else in the world. Now we're not perfect. Leadership is important in trying to make that better each day, each week, each month, each year. So, Honor and privilege to be with you today.